Now, how you spend your money will be determined entirely by what you value in life. Whether or not you're going to be a good husband or wife will, deter will be determined by your value system. Do you value not just the person, but do you value the, the vows that you make as a person? In other words, you, if you promise to be with a person, do you value keeping your word? If so, then does that mean that you really are going to stay with the person through sickness and in health, richer and poor? Yeah, but they changed. Did you? Because if you haven't changed, then your vows are still what they are. In other words, you made the promise. Your promise hasn't changed. But oftentimes we'll say, well, but I made the promise based off of whether or not that person is going to change. I don't, I don't know that that was in your vows. If we go back and watch the video of your wedding, I don't know that that's in your vows. But yeah, but that person lied to me, so that gives me a right to be. No, it doesn't give you a right to be that. If you value your word. Instead, if you're the person who says, I don't value keeping my word. Okay. Okay. But it doesn't make sense that you'd give your word in the first place then. But more than that, the purpose of morality is to live well live a good life and by good we don't just mean to get the things that you want we don't just mean to be successful in any kind of materialistic way it means to, to live a good life a proper life a life that is itself good not not confusing the word good with enjoyable but good in the sense of it's a proper properly lived life oftentimes morality is almost designed as a herd instinct we don't even know why we do it and you're going to notice the people who are the most successful, the people who do the best, are the ones who aren't worried about the herd instinct in the individual. It's incredible when you see, if you think about it, if you weren't pressured to, to, to be a certain way, think about the kinds of things that you would do in your life. It's social pressure that stops you oftentimes from pursuing the things in life that you want to pursue. And why does it work? Because we're afraid of being apart from the herd. The gazelle stays with the herd because there's safety in numbers. The gazelle that wanders off by itself is going to get eaten. But the lion wanders off by itself, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got a pack, but it wanders off by itself. Why? Because it's strong enough to stand on its own. So you start with a really important question, which is the why. It's the why. And we take it for granted, like you said, outside of some really obvious cases. That's that's probably the best place to begin with, with most reasoning. So if we're going to do the most complex math, where do we start with it? We start with the most obvious things, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And oftentimes, if I'm not mistaken, when we teach it, we begin with the very basic addition and subtraction. And then all of our mathematical, all of our mathematical principles will now start to evolve from there. So if we can get those basic things right and figure out, well, why this two plus two, this abstract idea of two objects plus two objects makes four. It seems very obvious to us, but once we can get those basics down, now we can start building the, the complex things on top of that. So when we say things like, well, you know, everybody disagrees about, well, no, there are some basic things that we agree about, the obvious things. Okay, what makes those things so obvious? And so if I ask the question, is it okay to murder people? Well, no, why not? Well, because you're murdering somebody. <laughs> That's a tautology, it's a circular reasoning. You shouldn't murder people because murder is bad. Why is murder bad? Well, murder is bad because you're killing people. Yeah, but what's wrong with killing people? And oftentimes we'll just be like, well, it, it just is. Figuring out the why of the just is, is important. Um, there's probably, there are probably very few things in life that are more worth figuring out than what our value systems are, because what your value systems are are going to determine how it is that you live. And how it is that you live is going to determine the kinds of things that you get in life, not just objects, but even whether or not you have a meaningful life, whether or not you have a successful life. Because you can only, it only makes sense to pursue the things that you find valuable. So for example, if you had a million dollars today, I wonder what it is you'd spend your million dollars on. I wonder how many of you guys, if you got a million dollars, would say, oh, dude, I'm gonna go clean out Barnes and Nobles. I'm gonna go buy all kinds of books because you're really into books. I wonder how many of you, if you got a million dollars today, would say, oh, dude, a million dollars, I'm going down to the car dealership. I'm gonna get that Ferrari I've always wanted. Now, how you spend your money will be determined entirely by what you value in life. Whether or not you're going to be a good husband or wife will, deter will be determined by your value system. Do you value not just the person, 
but do you value the, the vows that you make as a person? In other words, you, if you promise to be with a person, do you value keeping your word? If so, then does that mean that you really are going to stay with the person through sickness and in health, richer and poor? Yeah, but they changed. Did you? Because if you haven't changed, then your vows are still what they are. In other words, you made the promise. Your promise hasn't changed. But oftentimes we'll say, well, but I made the promise based off of whether or not that person is going to change. I don't, I don't know that that was in your vows. If we go back and watch the video of your wedding, I don't know that that's in your vows. Well, you know, I promise to be honest all the time. But yeah, but that person lied to me, so that gives me a right to be. No, it doesn't give you a right to be that. If you value your word. Instead, if you're the person who says, I don't value keeping my word. Okay. Okay. But it doesn't make sense that you'd give your word in the first place then. But now understand that if you value that, it's going to completely determine the course of your life. You're looking at a person, and you really are going to be with that person. Matt, what if they leave me? It still doesn't change your promise, does it? So it doesn't change your vow, does it? Oh, but that's unreasonable. Well, then that promise isn't for you. But now start figuring out if we can, if we can get to that point of like murder then. Okay, fine. We all agree you shouldn't murder. Why not? In other words, what is it about that act that we say that's the final line? And if we really delve into it, we probably can figure out why. Because we think of morality as just being like a code of how it is that you're going to live, which it is that. But again, What's the purpose of morality? Why do we have it? And if we figure out why it is that we have it, we can start to figure out why a subjective morality can be so dangerous. In other words, if, uh, what's the purpose of morality? Well, just to live rightly. For who? It's not just you, man. We need to have morality because that, it reflects the values of a society. And if we don't have a morality, then we can't go forward in, as a society. This is designed for a well-ordered society. But more than that, the purpose of morality is to live well, to live a good life. And by good, we don't just mean to get the things that you want. We don't just mean to be successful in any kind of materialistic way. It means to, to live a good life, a proper life, a life that is itself good. Not, not confusing the word good with enjoyable, but good in the sense of it's a proper, properly lived life. So morality is designed to take us to what that thing is. So for example, if you're a person who believes that we should live a good moral life, okay, so then your, then your morality should be directed towards that, proper living. If you believe that there is no, 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 um, no good life to live, well, then morality just doesn't make sense. But then you have to be very careful of people like that, people who just don't believe that there's such a thing as right and wrong. Why is it wrong to murder a person? Well, that's, that is the fundamental unit. Why? Because if you, if you understand that none of us is any better than anybody else. In other words, you take the, however it is you want, you want to measure, take the wealthiest person in the world, take the most educated person in the world, and you understand that they are no better or worse than a kraken. And we all have the same intrinsic worth. And that means that you don't have a right to take anybody else's life, regardless of the circumstances. But what if they make me really mad? What if they... I don't know, you can even get to a point of what if they kill somebody else? If you are no better or worse than that other person, then you do not have a right to take the other person's life. Okay, so then maybe the basis of morality is treating people as treating people as the equals that we are. Okay, so now you can start to figure out what else flows from that. Do you ever have a right to lie to a person then? Well, no. If it's true that we're all of equal value and we're all equal worth, well then no, you never have a right to lie to another person. Because when you do that, you're treating them as an object. Why do we lie to people? To get something out of them. Why do I use this cup? Because this cup delivers coffee to me. Imagine me trying to drink this coffee without a cup. You're sitting here slipping from my hand. So I use the cup for a purpose, a specific purpose, as, an, as the object that it is. Does my cup sit here and just go, nobody ever asks how I'm doing? No, because it doesn't have the same kind of sentience, the same kind of mentality of the rest of us. I didn't have any mentality at all or even any self-awareness. So therefore, I can use it as an object. A human being, though, has sentience. A human being has self-awareness. So therefore, <coughs> it's, it's on a very basic level, because there's no good reason to elevate or, 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 or depreciate other people, we have to treat ourselves as equal, and therefore, I don't have a right to lie to you. Because if I lie to you, I'm trying to get something out of you. 
no matter what it is, like what if you're what if you're lying to a person to make them feel better? First off, I'm depriving them of their humanity. I'm depriving them of knowing the truth. I'm deciding that how much truth you get to have. And, and again, what you think, what your values are, will determine how your life goes. So if I lie to you, and I, just by telling you something, even if it makes you feel better about yourself, I'm directing the course of your life without giving you the option to direct the course of your own life. Because the decisions that you make will be based off of the information that you have. So if I lie to you, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing your life in a, in a direction different from what you might have chosen for yourself. And I'm determining that for you. But here's the thing. If there is such a thing as an objective right or wrong, where does it come from? And the only place that this can come from, it seems, is probably from a god. Some kind of a, of, a, of a judge who determines what's right and what's wrong. And it's interesting when you think about the kinds of things that we determine to be right and wrong. Yeah. If does the, When the lion is on the, is on the savannah and the lion chases down the gazelle and tackles the gazelle and eats the gazelle, does the gazelle sit there, I'm sorry, does the lion sit back and go, my God, I've done this again. I can't believe I've done this. I've murdered another gazelle. No, it doesn't, of course. It's just doing what the, what the, what the lion does. And why does the lion do it? Because he's the strongest. And so you're going to notice that oftentimes morality is almost designed as a herd instinct. We don't even know why we do it. Oftentimes it's just kind of put on people. And you're going to notice the people who are the most successful, the people who do the best, are the ones who aren't worried about the herd instinct in the individual. It's incredible when you see, if you think about it, if you weren't pressured to, to, to be a certain way, think about the kinds of things that you would do in your life. It's social pressure that stops you oftentimes from pursuing the things in life that you want to pursue. And why does it work? Because we're afraid of being apart from the herd. The gazelle stays with the herd because there's safety in numbers. The gazelle that wanders off by itself is going to get eaten. But the lion wanders off by itself, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got a pack, but it wanders off by itself. Why? Because it's strong enough to stand on its own. It doesn't need a society to tell it what's right and what's wrong. <coughs> I was talking to a friend of mine recently. Uh, my friend lives in, in, in Vegas. Um, we'll call her Bubbles. She needs a name. Color Bubbles, and um, Bubbles was uh, she. She gave me a, a list of movies to watch because she's you know she loves movies, and so I was wa watching some of them. And it's a really interesting thing because she's pretty like straight laced herself, you know, um, very protective parents, um, very very well mannered, very I mean everything right about the person, but also very sheltered by by her own admission. She she says that she's very sheltered. But she lives in Las Vegas. It's difficult to be sheltered when you're living in a city like that because she gets to see a whole different side that's different almost from how it is that, that she was raised. And she, when I'm looking at the movie list, it's interesting because the movie list is comprised almost entirely of things that I can tell that she would do if she didn't feel socially constrained. So think about the movies that you're interested in. Anybody in here like a, a Batman fan? I wonder if you really could do it. You'd go out there and just beat the crap out of criminals. You know, because you have a, a similar kind of a mentality. Why don't you? Well, first of all, I don't want to die. But secondly, it's like, oh, it's just kind of weird, isn't it? Like, what will people think? Well, the whole idea is no one's supposed to know. What would you do if no one knew? What would you do if no one judged you? It takes courage to be able to do that, to, set, to, to stand outside of that. And, and she, um, I don't want to go too much into it, but she ended up doing something not too long ago that kind of followed... One of the, the movies that, um, that, 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 she, that she recommended it was her favorite movie. And she ended up auditioning for a show that, you know, she, she's, into, you know she's into like singing and dancing and stuff like that, but it's something completely outside of what she would normally do. Why? Well, yeah, she lives there, but when she's there, she's away from San Diego. She can almost reinvent and be who she wants to be without that social judgment. She doesn't have a big peer group there. So it almost is liberating, it's freeing. When you feel like, well, like there's some people who, who feel isolated and alone, and that sucks if it's not by choice. And so what do we do? Well, we do what other people do so that we can um, kind of form a herd with other people. But when you finally decide to do what you want to do and separate yourself from that, it's gonna be hard. That's why most people don't do it. It's tough because you have to be able to stand strongly on your own. And if you do your own thing, what's going to happen? Well, you're gonna be criticized, duh. Why? Because people, all, because 
It isn't just that you're different, but people don't like it when you're different. Why? Because it reminds them that they're not different. And it takes courage. And it reminds them that they don't have the courage to stand on their own. Why don't we like the kid in class who answers all the teacher's questions? Because it reminds us that we don't have the answers. And even if we did, we don't have the courage to answer them. We'd rather just kind of sit back and, I mean, I wonder how often in here I ask a question and you know the answer. We have a good idea what the answer is. I know from reading a lot of your journals, a lot of you guys have some really smart stuff to say. You do. And I always think, I read them, I go, man, I wish you had said that in class. Why don't we? Oh, I just don't want to say anything. It takes courage. Why? Because you have to speak out and have a voice, but also you open yourself up to, to, to criticism. But what do you care? You're going to be criticized by people who are too afraid to speak up. Unless, of course, they're in a group of people. You know, the internet mob can come for you at any moment, I suppose. And so it takes courage to stand up to that. The herd stays together because it's, it's afraid. The, the society follows very specific social moral standards because it controls you. It makes you do what's good for society. Rather than living a morality that's designed to live a good life, oftentimes societies create a morality that's just designed to perpetuate a society. It's not a good life, but a society. It keeps the people who are in power in power, and it stops people who are not in power from, be from, from becoming powerful. And so when you find yourself living in such a way that, you know, often as we think like we're the rebel, like, oh, I'm, I'm speaking out, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going, dude, you have all these mediums in the world to speak out, and you're being allowed to. If you're being allowed to speak out without much pushback from, from the official channels, you might not be as much of a rebel as you think. You might actually be saying exactly what they want you to, and if that's your, if that, if that, those are your views, fine, then those are your views. But the point is that if you're somebody who actually does speak out and say something that's a bit different, well, what's gonna to happen to you? We talked about that in this class, yes? What happens if you try to change the world? Yeah, you get shot. We talked about that in here, yes? No, yes, no, yeah. Yeah. And so, it doesn't mean you have to die, <laughs> hopefully not. All I'm saying is that it takes courage to set yourself apart because the herd's going to attack you. But so what? They're like a, a swarm of gnats. They're gonna be loud, they're gonna come after you, and they're gonna cancel you, and they're gonna say all kinds of, they're gonna say mean words about you. So what? They're just words. Ah, oh, but then you aren't gonna have any, you aren't going to have any, any friends. That's what we're afraid of then. We're afraid of doing the right thing because we're afraid that we're not gonna have any friends. So it's almost this idea that if you want to have friends, you have to compromise who you are, compromise your beliefs, compromise your integrity, compromise the good life. And you're exchanging your morals, you're exchanging your values for stuff. For people who don't really like you, they like this avatar that you've created, this persona that you've created. It takes courage to step apart from the herd. You have to be strong also. Not just have the guts to do it, but you have to have the strength to do it as well and be successful. That's the hard part. You know, if there's like, you know, um, you know, I don't know. Like, you know, there's this rash of people online who are mouthing off to groups of people. Why? They don't think anything's gonna happen to them. And then the clips go viral. Why? Because someone punches them in the face. And all of a sudden we're horrified. Oh my God, I can't believe they did that. Well, why not? Because you thought you could just be courageous without there being any real uh, consequences for it. To be courageous means to understand the consequences and do it anyway. But now you have to have the, the, the ability to also defend it. That doesn't mean you have to go out and learn how to fight. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is that you have to have not just the courage, but the strength to stand on your own. That's what the lion has. The lion has the courage and the lion has the strength. And maybe we can top that off with having the intellect as well to be able to do it. So morality is just herd instinct in the individual. Most of us, what we say is right and wrong. We don't know why we think it's right or wrong. It's been socialized into us. And the reason it's been socialized into us is because it promotes the society, not you as an individual. If you want to develop yourself as an individual, figure out what's right and wrong for yourself. And then you live it. And then you live beyond good and evil. When people say, what you're doing is evil, whatever, it's a word. It doesn't mean anything. Even the people using it don't know what it means. When people say something is evil, what we normally mean is, I just don't like what you're saying. You know? 
that's good. In other words, that, what that usually means is that benefits me, and so I like it. So yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. No. Live beyond good and evil. Live beyond good and evil. And I guess maybe live out your, your movie playlist. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques.